Hello everybody and welcome to Civi 398 Continuum Mechanics. Now it's 11 o'clock, I just got back from the in-person lecture and you guys may be thinking, Clayton, what the hell? <laughs> you just presented to us, you told us you were recording it, and I did, but a little problem. The audio wasn't so good, so I thought to myself, well, you guys deserve better than crappy audio. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to re-record this lecture for you guys. Because, again, you guys deserve better audio quality than what was given through the AirPods. Now, for online students, this is something that you guys may be saying, well, this just looks like remote session. And yes, that's true. This first lecture will be a remote session, but lecture two, all the way to the end, they will be live. The recording equipment at the university wasn't quite ready for today, so I had to try and make do with what I had. Turns out what I had was garbage, <laughs> so I'm re-recording it. But lecture two, all the way to the end, they will have actual recordings of me in the lecture hall, which will be nice to, for you guys to see me actually in a lecture hall rather than at my, at my little desk at home. And this is great because I can actually touch upon some stuff that wasn't really apparent in the lecture. I think I misheard a question, stuff like that. So we're going to try and clear everything up. So again, welcome to Civi 398. Introduction to Continuum Mechanics here at the University of Alberta. This is going to be lecture one and this lecture is nice and easy. Basically we're going to look through the syllabus and then we're going to have a brief introduction to some mathematical symbols. Another reason why I like uh, re-recording this is you guys can actually see me. I didn't want the first lecture to be just uh, kind of a PowerPoint. I want you guys to see me. Uh, hopefully we can uh, create some sort of bond. Uh, <laughs> classes should be fun. Uh, there should be a lot of back and forth with the instructors, so hopefully uh, we can have fun with this class together. And I have my glasses now, so I can actually read these sort of things. So for everyone who's just joining us, the question first becomes, all right, what is continuum mechanics? When you guys look at your course schedule, you guys have a lot of courses like Civi 330, which we know it has to do with hydraulics, water, so we know as civil engineers, this probably means we're gonna be dealing with pipelines, stuff like that. It makes sense, it's intuitive. Other courses like Civi 372 or 374, they deal with structures. One structural analysis, the other is structural design. So again, it's very easy to take those courses and see what exactly we're doing with them in real life. But when we look at this course right here, Continuum Mechanics, this has a lot of students scratching their heads saying, Clayton, what the hell is that? The other courses, I know exactly what I'm getting out of them and how I can apply it to my civil degree. But I don't really know what continuum mechanics is. I've never heard of a continuum mechanics engineer. I've heard of structural engineer and water engineer and transportation engineer, but continuum mechanics sounds kind of weird. Well, continuum mechanics to me and how I want you guys to see it is kind of the very introduction to simulation math. Simulation math, what is that? Well, I know as engineers, at one point or another, you guys have seen what we call the finite element method. And if we look right here, here's kind of a picture of it, where we can take an object, run it in the computer and simulate it to find out its behavior, whether it be the stresses, strains, displacement, something like that. And it usually gives us a colorful contour map of the stresses, the strains, or the displacements. What we really, rarely, not really, <laughs> rarely realize is that there's a lot of math involved in, in these computer programs to simulate this. Now, <coughs> excuse me, this course is kind of an introduction into that math. How exactly are we able to simulate these sort of things? Now, I told this to the lecture people in person, and I'm going to reiterate it again. C continuum mechanics is very, very broad. It has a lot of different areas. What we're going to be specializing in is something called solid mechanics. So if we take continuum mechanics at the top, it can be branched into two pieces. Solid mechanics, which is the mechanics of solids. So if I were to take my PowerPoint clicker, it's a solid. If I were to start applying some forces, we know it can bend, it'll have stress, it'll have strain. But another branch of continuum mechanics is fluid mechanics, how waters run, how rivers, stuff like that. We're not going to get into that in this course. So even though it's called continuum mechanics, which is very general, this is basically an introduction to solid mechanics. We're going to be looking at solid things, specifically beams, and how to analyze the stresses and strains induced on beams when we load them. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. So this is the course E-class page, and we're going to scroll down, 
It has my name, Clayton Pettit, uh, not Petit. <laughs> I know I'm going to get that a million times throughout the semester. It's okay, I'm used to it. Uh, here is my email and my office, but I'm currently changing offices. So this is something that was actually, I was told after the lecture today. So don't, uh, don't take too much weight into that office space. Another thing I want to say is I'm just sorry for my voice. I actually lost my voice last week and it's still coming back. So if I sound a little weird, that's the reason why. So that's some preliminary information about me. Let's jump into the course syllabus. So one of the first things that you guys will see in e-class is this list of things and we have our course syllabus. So we're gonna open it into a new page. We're gonna zoom in and we're just going to look through what is going to be expected in this course. So again, it's CIVI 398, Introduction to Continuum Mechanics, uh, the fall 2021 20, semester, and it goes from September 1st to December 7th. Now there is a little bit of an issue and this might actually turn into December 8th. We're still waiting to see, but I don't think it'll actually impact this course. The class time is Tuesday and Thursdays from 8 to 9.20, and the location is ETLC E1003. So that's where I was this morning at 8 o'clock. I saw many of you guys. It was great. We had fun. But as I said to the in-person in -person lecture uh, students, we also have online students. So for those online students, welcome. This video is for you guys. Unfortunately, the lectures will not be streamed live. This has to do with the fact that there are so many classes going on at the University of Alberta at the same time. And if we were to all stream live, well, it's gonna create a lot of bandwidth problems. So they only had select classes stream live. I'm one of those classes that won't be streaming live, but what I'll do is I'll record every lecture video. I'm gonna throw it on YouTube and I will have it to you guys within the same day or within 24 hours of when the lecture occurs, okay? So it's something I apologize for. Uh, I'd prefer to have it live so you guys can ask questions, but this is the way it is. So again, I have my contact information, uh, the office, subject change, I will let you guys know, and I have office hours. So it's one of the things that when we create a syllabus, we have to specify some office hours. And I put Tuesdays and Thursdays from 10 to 12. As we discussed in the lecture today, that's probably not gonna happen because everyone has class. So basically we have seminars at one o'clock on Tuesdays and Thursdays, one o'clock and the lecture ends at 9.20. And in that period from 9.20 to one o'clock, I'll be around in my office. So if you're an in-person student, feel free to come by and talk to me. And if you're an online student, please email me. I'm gonna send a mass email out tonight for everybody. But uh, I thought I wouldn't make office hours, virtual office hours, because I don't know your guys' schedule. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna send an email out tonight to everybody. You guys can tell me what works best for you. Because at the end of the day, you guys are paying for this class. You guys deserve the best. Whatever works for you guys will work for me. So I'll, I'll make it work. Uh, just a general course description. So basically in this course, we're gonna be looking at three major components and we're gonna start relating them. That is strains, stresses, and displacements. Again, the whole thing that we're trying to do is take continuums, which are basically bodies, and we wanna simulate them. We wanna say, all right, if I apply this load to my desk here, how much is it going to deflect? What will the strain be? What will the stress be? And as we're going to see, this has to do a lot with differential equations. Now, the problem with differential equations is they can be a real bitch to solve. Let's be honest, it's not fun solving differential equations. So what we end up doing in the later half of this course is start discussing ways that we can approximate these differential equations. The finite element method or that picture that we saw with all the pretty colors of the stresses that is actually an approximation method because again, realistically, it's very hard to simulate things and get an exact solution. So what we do is actually uh, approximate them using a variety of different methods. Uh, we have two TAs in this course. You won't see them very much because I myself will be running the seminars, but they will be in charge of creating the assignment code. So uh, they'll be kind of in the background for us. Uh, again, we have seminars on Tuesdays and Thursdays, one to two o'clock in NREF. Uh, this is for the online students. Again, when I send the mass email out tonight regarding office hours, I will also ask what time generally works for a seminar for the online students. Uh, the department told us that we don't have to do an online seminar. We can just uh, post a recording of our in-person seminars, but seminars are a great way to ask questions. So I really want to do a live one for the online students so that they get a chance to ask any questions that they may have. So. 
that I'll be covering later. Uh, we have a bunch of different learning outcomes in this course. Uh, it's kind of boring to read, but you guys can read it if you want. And I want to get into the juicy parts. So there's going to be four components making up uh, this course, assignments, two midterms, and a final exam. So the assignments are going to be due weekly. So there's going to be 10 assignments total, each due on Friday, as we'll discuss, and they are worth 25% of your final grade. We have two midterms, midterm one and midterm two, and I already penciled in the dates for these midterms. So the first one is October 7th, it's worth 15%, and then we have November 4th, and it is worth 25%. Now you're saying, Clayton, how do you know if these dates work with us? Well, these two midterms will actually take place during class time. So instead of having a lecture on those two days in the morning, you guys will be writing a midterm. Now these midterms will be online, so both the online students and the in-person students will be writing at the exact same time. As I uh, kind of showed you, Midterm one is worth less than midterm two, and that's because midterm one is basically more review, and we're gonna talk about that when we discuss the topics in this course. Uh, we also have a final exam, and it's worth 35%, and it's basically to be determined. We don't, we as the faculty don't really know how this semester is going to go, so we're not setting anything in stone yet, but I promise as soon as I know when the final exam is or the schedule, I will let you guys know. No matter what happens though, the final exam will be 50 multiple choice questions, and we'll discuss that uh, a little bit later. Scrolling down, just a bunch of extra information, but this is one thing I want to highlight. This course has an online textbook. Here is the link to it right here, and it's completely free. Everything, or the theory of all the topics covered in this course, they're in this textbook. You guys will be good to go. Uh, the University of Alberta is doing a really great job on basically providing students free resources so that you guys don't have to keep buying books and stuff like that, which I personally think is great. Uh, you guys shouldn't have to spend money if you guys don't have to. Uh, also, I will post previous midterm one, midterm two, and final examinations for your purposes to study, and I'll show you on eClass where to find that. After that, we have a bunch of things about mental health. So if you guys are stressed or any of those, uh, please seek help or talk to me. I'd love to help you guys. This course shouldn't stress you guys out. I want you guys to have a nice, fun, happy time. Uh, this is a top, This course has a lot of topics that I love and pretty passionate about, so hopefully you guys can have the same passion and joy. But I know uh, I was a student at the U of A myself, and I know sometimes it can be a little bit tough, so don't be afraid to reach out. We're all here to help you guys and give you guys the best experience possible. So here's some information on that if you guys need it. And at the very end of our course outline, we have our course schedule. So of course, this is subject to change, but I'm going to try my best to kind of stick to it. So we have all of our lectures and the topics in each lecture. We have the date of the seminars. And then again, we also have midterm exams on specific class dates. So we have midterm one up here on October 7th, and we have midterm two on November 4th. And again, they're both during class. So I tried my best to make sure to highlight that for you guys. So that's the course syllabus. If you guys have any questions, feel free to email me. I'd be happy to answer anything that you guys, or any questions that you guys may have. So I'm gonna exit out there. We're gonna go back to eClass and we're gonna start discussing some of the more, uh, I guess the other resources we have available. So we have a Discord server right here. I created a Discord server for this class, so if you guys wanna join, it's a great way to ask questions. Either your fellow classmates would be happy to help you, or I'd be happy to help you. I I don't really have a life, so I'll be on the computer quite a bit. If I see a question pop up, it's very simple for me to just answer it right then and there. So you guys can join it if you like, completely optional to you guys. And I promise that anything juicy in the Discord server, such as exam dates, exam tips, stuff like that, I will send an email to everybody. I'll, I will always do my best to make sure that everybody gets the exact same information so some people don't feel left out. I also have a link to the online textbook, so if I were to right click it, it would take me right to that textbook as I mentioned, and then there is a link for Mathematica software. A lot of the assignments we will do in this class rely on this Mathematica software to use. So here is a link, uh, University of Alberta has it free, but uh, I saw a little message saying that some students are having a little bit of troubles accessing it, so I'll, I'll look into that. But it's a key piece of software I really recommend picking up. It'll help you guys a lot with your assignments as well as things like midterm and final exam preparation. So 
just something to be aware of. If you guys don't want to use Mathematica and prefer things like MATLAB or Python, go right ahead. I'm not going to be the one to stop you, but I find for this course, since we're dealing with a lot of differential equations, Mathematica makes uh, for very simple solutions. Now, this is where it gets fun. So as we can see here, we have a lot of tabs in this course. The first one is recorded lectures. So again, unfortunately, I will not be live streaming the lectures as they happen, but as soon as they are done, we have an AV tech who is going to record everything and upload or give me basically the media file. From there, I'm going to throw it on YouTube and this is where I'll put the link. So this video you're watching right now, I will have the link here in topic one, linear vector spaces. As we can see, topic one has three lectures. So the link to all three of these lecture videos will be placed here. We move to topic two, they'll be placed here, etc., etc. Now, if you guys are saying, Clayton, your lecture videos are kind of garbage, I prefer something a little bit more interesting. <laughs> we have previous lecture videos by Dr. Samir Deep. He was the previous instructor of this course. He is probably one of the smartest people I've ever met. So that's also a very good resource to have. So again, this is where I'll be posting all of the lecture video links. And these will be the live lectures. So this will contain everything that I taught that day inside the lecture. So it'll have some theory, it'll have some examples, and it'll just have some random banter I have with the students because that's the best part of in-person teaching is kind of uh, giving the students a hard time as many of you guys saw today. After that, we have our topics. So this course has 11 topics, but I really want to emphasize that it's only 10. This last topic right here, finite element analysis, it is more of a graduate level topic. So I will introduce it to you guys. I'll show you guys some software, but you guys will not be tested on this topic. Again, it's, it's quite advanced. It's basically the math behind these actual simulations. So we don't really get into it too much. It's fun to know, but uh, this will not be tested on any exam. So this leaves topics one to 10 as our actual content for this course. So the first two topics, linear vector spaces and tensors and matrices, these are basically going to be a review of linear algebra. And these are what is going to be on midterm one. So midterm one exam will cover topic one and topic two and nothing else. Again, it's basically just a review for you guys to get familiar with linear algebra again and get used to the nomenclature that we are going to be showing a lot in this course. Should be nice and easy, but it'll also be very boring. Anything to do with linear algebra, always very boring. I've never seen fun linear algebra, but uh, so I, I just want to prepare you guys for that. So that's topics one and two. After that, we get into the actual good stuff, the good meat of this course, and that is deformation and strain. So as we're going to see, we're gonna to go topic three, which is basically strain. And then we're gonna move on to topic four and five, which is stress. And then topic six, which is constitutive laws, which basically takes the strain that we talked about and the stress that we talked about and relates them together. For instance, if I know what the strain is in a body, I can actually find out what the stress is and vice versa. If I know what the stress is in a body, I can calculate the strains. So that's what it's going to be. So midterm number two is going to focus on these topics right here, topic three, four, five, and six, which basically is stress, strain, and the relationships between them. All right, so hopefully that makes sense to you guys. After that, we get into topics seven, eight, nine, and 10, which is plane beam approximations, strain energy, virtual work, and the Rayleigh-Ritz method. So as I kind of mentioned here, when we're solving these bodies, we use differential equations. And if we make a lot of assumptions, linear elasticity, stuff like that, it becomes very easy to solve and we can just solve our differential equation using Mathematica or by hand. Problem is in reality is it's, it's not that simple. All those assumptions we made, well, they're not really valid. So in the later half of this course, we're gonna talk about how can we solve these differential equations through approximation methods because the actual exact solution can be too difficult to actually determine. So that's what we get into in these topics and they will be topics covered in the final. Now the final is cumulative, so it's gonna cover everything, but there's gonna be a lot of emphasis on these last uh, four topics. So we'll talk about that when the time comes. So these are all the topics. Now inside of each topic, I have a couple different things. So I'm gonna open up topic one and we basically have lectures, examples, online textbook and learning outcomes. So under lectures, this is where I'm going to post the notes for this class. Now I post two versions. The first one 
is my actual lecture PowerPoint in color. So as you guys may know, I like to do things in color. I find it helps to highlight certain things and give you guys kind of nice tips and tricks. But I know that this would be a real bitch to try and print out. You guys would all hate me. So what I did is I would also send you guys the printer version, which is the same notes, but in black and white. So you guys will have both versions. If you guys are on your iPads, you guys may want the colored version. If you guys are printing it out and having the hard copy, you guys might prefer the printer version. Now again, my voice still kind of coming back. I'm sure you guys hear it and say, Clayton, you must have been smoking too much. And uh, no, no, I haven't. It's, it, I just lost my voice. But I will also post lecture videos concerning these lecture topics. And it's going to be very concise. It's just going to be about that actual lecture theory. It's not going to be everything we do in the actual lecture. So let's say that you guys are, you know, actually I have it over here. Let's say that you guys are concerned about momentum balance. Well, rather than looking at our live recording of momentum balance up here, where we kind of discuss as a class, and you got, you guys can come over here and you guys can right click this lecture video of momentum balance. It's not gonna have the examples we cover. It's not gonna have any of the in-class banter. It's just gonna be a very concentrated video related to momentum balance. So by the end of the semester, again, we'll have two versions of the notes and each section will have a lecture video. So that's what's gonna be there. Now, if we were to go back up here, we can see that under our lectures, we have examples. So the best way I thought to do examples was to make them quizzes. So as we can see, some of you guys have already started attempting things, but when we open up a quiz, we it's basically just extra practice. So if we were to come over here, I can open it up. I can continue the last attempt. And basically it's just a bunch of questions that you guys can go ahead to practice your knowledge. Now. One thing to keep in mind is that these are not worth any marks. All these example quizzes, they're just for fun. They're just to help you guys try and apply some of the knowledge that you guys learn. And we'll cover it in class uh, sometimes too to really emphasize points, but it's just for extra practice. Now you guys may be saying, all right, Clayton, this is great. Let's say that I did quiz number seven, change of basis, and I got something wrong. And I don't know where I went wrong. I thought I was going to get it correct. Well, if you guys didn't attend the lecture, you guys would have to go up here and sort through the recorded lecture videos to try and find out when I did the example. But that might be a little bit time consuming and, and I know as students, you guys don't really have a lot of time. So just below all these examples, all these quizzes, I have video solutions for every single one. So instead of going and trying to sort through the live lecture, you guys can just come down here, you guys can go quiz seven, you guys can open her up, It'll take you to YouTube and I'll basically have the video solution for each one of these quizzes. So hopefully that'll help save you guys some time. And I have this for every single subject. So again, momentum balance, we have a nice quiz here and we have the example video solution guide. If you guys have any questions about that, please let me know. I'd be happy to help you guys. So that's examples. After that, we have the online textbook. So again, up here, we have the online textbook link, which takes you to the homepage. But you guys, again, don't have a lot of time. You guys don't want to be sorting through the whole textbook. So for the topics covered in topic one, I have the link to all the specific things we want. So let's say you guys were curious about types of maps. All you guys have to do is open this up and it'll take you right to the website and you guys can figure out what type of maps or the different types of maps, stuff like that. And then finally, we also have learning objectives. So these are something that you guys can look at if you want. It's basically what we expect you guys to take from this course. Uh, I wouldn't look at it as if I was a student because it, I don't know, it's kind of boring to me, but it's there if you guys want it. Again, the whole goal here is to provide you guys as students with as many resources as possible so that you guys feel like you're adequate to solve any of the problems found in this course. So. That's kind of it for the topics, what to expect in each sort of one. Let's move on to the midterm exams. So midterm exams one and two, they will be on E-class here. And again, they will take place during the lecture time. So they'll go from eight o'clock to 920 Mountain Standard Time in the morning. And both of them are 25 multiple choice questions. Now the questions won't all be weighted equally but again, they'll just be multiple choice questions and you'll do it right here on E-Class. You guys won't see this because I have it hidden from you guys, but when the exam day comes around, this will be open. You guys can start the exam. It'll automatically end once the timer is up and you guys will have your grades. 
Now, to study for these, I've included a bunch of previous midterm exams. So if you guys should drop down this box here, I gave you guys the old midterm one from 2014, 2015, 2016, as well as the solutions. And I did the exact same thing for midterm two. So if I were to open this bad boy up, 2014, 2015, 2016, as well as the solutions. Again, it's just providing students with as many resources as possible so that they feel comfortable in this course. Uh, the final exam is probably going to be the exact same thing as the midterms. We're still waiting to see how the semester goes. Uh, I have previous final exams for you guys to solve and it's going to be 50 multiple choice questions. So no matter if it's in person online, it'll always be 50 multiple choice questions. The date and the time, that's still to be determined. So that is exams. Now let's go into the last thing which is going to take us kind of the most time, which is assignments. So this course has 10 assignments. So if we open up the assignment tab and go down to assignments right here and open it up, we have assignment one, two, three, four, etc. Now these assignments are gonna be due on Fridays at five o'clock Mountain Standard Time. I wanted to make it before the weekend so you guys can just relax on the weekend. Now to really help you guys relax, I have the assignments as unlimited attempts, all right? Unlimited attempts, and yes, you guys heard that right. It's something you don't hear very often, but basically to me as an instructor, I want you guys to feel as comfortable as possible with the material. When I give you guys an assignment, I don't want to stress you guys out to make you guys feel dumb, make you guys just say, you know what, this continuum mechanics sucks. I don't want anything to do with it. That's what Dr. Yong Lee is for. <laughs> that guy is also crazy smart and he's almost, uh, he, he's too smart for us, if you know what I mean. So that's not what we're gonna have in this class. So a limited attempt. So if you guys go through the assignment, get 20%, who cares? You guys just redo the assignment and then you get 40%. Well, great. You keep going and going and you guys can keep trying until you get that 100%. Now, the grade that will be submitted to the grade book is the highest of the submitted attempts. So let's say you try it the first time, you get 40%. You try it the second time and you get 100%, great. But then you try it a third time and you get 60%. Well, don't worry, the actual grade submitted will be that 100%. It'll always take the highest version. So you don't have to keep redoing it over and over again. Now, the assignments were designed so that each student has their own unique parameters, their own unique variables. So let's go to assignment number 10 here just for fun. Let's attempt it just to show you guys what exactly I mean. So for instance, a lot of these parameters in the beam, 10 meters, 20 GPA, three over a thousand meters to the fourth, those will be different for every single student. So every time you guys attempt this, it's going to have different numbers. So that's something to be aware of. And this is why we do it, all these assignments in Mathematica, because if you guys have a new assignment with different numbers, you guys can just change the numbers in your code. Everything will work out pretty nicely. So again, these are the assignments. They're due weekly. And the first one is due September 17th, 2021. And then after that, we can see it's basically one week intervals. Now, once the assignment is submitted, I will unhide the practice assignments. So these are going to be just duplications of the actual assignments just for you guys to study. Because again, every time you attempt it, you're going to have different numbers. So if you guys are studying for the final, you guys can go to assignment one practice and just redo it over and over again to get a, a good hang for what's being asked for in the assignments. Now, let's talk about resources available. There's going to be two major things. And the first one is seminars. So I have seminar recordings and seminar slides. In this course, we have seminars, which are one hour sessions, and they are Tuesdays and Thursdays. And the whole point in the seminars, and I'll be running them, is just to help you guys with the assignment. We're gonna do it as a group. We're all gonna sit down and we're gonna say, all right, here's question one, how do we do it? And then we work together to figure it out. And we do the same thing for assignment two, assignment three, every week. Now this is really good, especially when we're dealing with Mathematica because we can work together to try and create code that will work for our assignment. So it's basically just a group problem solving session where we, me included, work with you guys to try and figure out how to solve the assignments. Now we have some resources available. So last year I recorded all of the seminars. So we have all the recordings except for seminar four. Uh, I, I was moving, <laughs> moving uh, buildings. So I wasn't able to record seminar four 
and we also have the PDFs of all the seminars. So all the information related to the seminars I have posted for you guys to kind of help you out. Now, again, I know that you guys are busy people. You guys are probably thinking, Clayton, I don't have enough time to watch your one hour long seminar recording if I need help with just a simple question. And that's why I have this right here. And this has been the most successful thing that I've implemented in this course, assignment guide videos. So let's say that you guys are doing the assignments and you're doing assignment six and you guys only need help with question number two. You guys know the rest, you just need question number two. Well, rather than sifting through the seminar recordings, we go assignment six and we can go question two. I have made YouTube videos for every single assignment question that we have. So if you guys need that little bit of extra help, here you guys go. There are links to all the YouTube videos and hopefully this will help you guys. Again, my whole goal for this course is to have you guys use the assignments to help your knowledge. It's not to test you guys or stress you out. <laughs> That's what the exams are for. This is just to make you guys feel very comfortable with the material. Now, the last thing I'm going to touch upon, of course, in assignments is if we scroll down, we have two bonus assignments. I'm not sure how I'm going to make the bonus marks work yet. Basically, we have one due in November and the other one due at the last day of class. The first one is just a simple kind of research project where you just type up basically one page of information. And then the second one is using that finite element software that we're going to be discussing in topic 11. These are completely optional, but they're pretty easy to do once you guys know what you're doing. So that's going to be assignments. If you guys have any questions, feel free to email me or contact me in the Discord. So remember again, we have a Discord link uh, right here to join the server where everyone can start asking their questions and basically having fun. <laughs> That's what this course should be, just a bunch of fun. So again, just a little recap of E-Class. We have our recorded lectures where I'm going to be posting the videos of the actual live lectures. We have all of our topics, we have assignments, and then we have exams. So it should be fairly straightforward to you guys. All right, so with that being said, we're gonna now take a jump from basically the course introduction to the first topic in the course. So if I were to go topic one here, lecture one, we're going to discuss mathematical symbols. Now this isn't going to have a lot of value. It's basically to get you ready for the course to come. It's not continuum mechanics. It's basically just the snooze fest. It's, it's pretty boring. I'm not gonna lie to you guys. I'm one of those guys that if, if it's boring, I'm gonna tell you guys it's boring. And this one's, this one's boring. <laughs> but it's something we need to know for the remaining topics in this course. So with that being said, I'm going to start the PowerPoint presentation right now. So I'll go from current slide. It should be mathematical preliminaries. I'm gonna see if the, the clicker works, perfect. Take a drink of water. Uh, doing the same lecture back to back can be uh, pretty fun. But there was actually a little typo in the slide. So I fixed the typo, so it's kind of a win. So again, the course is called Continuum Mechanics, but we're basically focusing in on solid mechanics. So under all my lectures, I'm gonna call them solid mechanics because well, that's what it is. I don't want to call it continuum mechanics and then you'll have some guy who's a big water nerd come in all excited and then I break his heart or her heart. So we're going to we're going to avoid, avoid that heartbreak. So again, the first topic is just some mathematical preliminaries. In order to get into stresses, strains, displacements, we have to have a good understanding of linear algebra. So that's going to be the first uh, couple topics of this course. So the first thing we're going to discuss is sets. So a set of elements is defined using curly brackets. So what I can do is I can say that A is equal to, and then in curly brackets, one comma two. This would be referred to as a set, where one and two are the elements of A. Now the size doesn't really matter. So I can go B is equal to one, two, and three, and I can have any numbers I want. So in this case for C, I have three, negative one, and two. Now. It's also worth mentioning that I say that inside of these curly brackets, we have elements. We don't have numbers all the time. If I wanted to, I can say that A is equal to Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. That is perfectly valid. It's basically just a set of elements. Now, the fun, be the fun begins when we start talking about specific mathematical symbols. So the first one we're gonna talk about is this elements of a set. And it's kind of like a fancy little E as we can see here. So we use this to define the element of a set. So let's say that we had A, which is a set of one and two. What I can say is that one is an element of A. 
I can also say that two is also an element of A. So I hope that you guys can start seeing what I mean by these elements of a set. Basically, numbers one and two, they're located in A, so they are elements of A. That's, that's the simple one. It gets a little bit more complex, but not too bad when we start talking about subsets. So if one set contains all of the elements of another set, and the key word here is all, it has to contain all of the elements of another set, we call that a subset. And we use this by using the symbol, it kind of looks like C. It's basically E, but without the, the middle stroke there. So let's say we have the two sets. We have A, which is one and two, and we have B, which is one, two, and three. If we look at A here, it has one and two, but we also notice that in B, it also has one and two. So all of the elements of A are located in B. So from here, we can say that A is actually a subset of B. And again, the keyword here, all of the elements have to be present. If B was missing the two, well then A is not a subset. It has to have all of those elements. Now another thing we can do with sets is we can actually define them using the properties. All right, Clayton, what exactly do you mean by that? Well, what I can do is I can say that A contains a set of elements X where X is the first three months. So I defined a variable and then I gave the definition of that variable. So in this case, if we have the variable X and we said that X is actually the first three months. Well, what this means is that A is actually equal to January, February, and March. Again, it's defining the set using properties rather than just listing all the numbers or all of the elements. Now, why is this important? Well, in continuum mechanics, we deal with a fixed sets, fixed sets. So some fixed sets include the natural numbers, which we use as double N, and these would go one, two, three, four, etc. We also have integers, which we use double Z, and these go from negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, etc. And the, one of the key things here is it has that zero value. As we're going to see, that zero value is very important to us. We can get a little bit more complex when we start talking about rational numbers, Q, and we can define them as this. So this is where I talked about defining a set using properties. We say that rational numbers are A divided by B, where A and B have to be integers. So as we can see, A and B are elements of integers, and B cannot be zero. That makes sense because we can't divide by zero. So basically, rational numbers are just fractions. Now, these are usually pretty good. However, we know that in some cases, some numbers can't be expressed as a rational number. Think of pi, all those digits of pi, they go on and on and on. So what we do in continuum mechanics is we focus on the set of real numbers, which we call R. And in this case, the set of real numbers goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. And again, in this course, we're gonna be focusing on these real numbers. Now, if we look at the set of real numbers, we didn't define it as a set with curly brackets. We actually defined it as an interval. So we can define intervals in many different ways, namely box brackets and round brackets. So box brackets are called closed intervals and they include that end number. Well, round brackets designate open intervals and do not include that end number. Now you guys may be saying, Clayton, what does that mean? Including the end number, well, let's take a peek. Let's say that we define the interval using these round brackets zero to one. This is the set of real numbers between zero and one, but it does not include zero and one specifically. If I were to switch this to square brackets, it's the same set of real numbers between zero and one, but now we include zero as well as one. And we can mix and match. So this can become a, a real bitch in exams, but we can give you one uh, round bracket, one square bracket, and this would be the set of real numbers between zero and one, but this time we only include one. Zero would not be included. This is a really good one when we start talking about types of maps. Now these set of real numbers have some very nice properties, and it's going to sound very, very simple now. So you're saying, Clayton, this is obvious. Why are you telling me this? Well, this properties are actually going to be applied to vectors. Now the vectors, it's going to look really crazy and that's where students start to get mixed up. So I like showing you it now when it's still really simple so you guys know what I mean by these properties. The first one is closed under addition 
Again, you look at that and it's not really apparent, what does this mean? Well, it's actually very simple. If I were to take two real numbers and add them together, the result is always another real number. So if I were to go simply two plus three, which we know is equal to five, this means it's closed under addition because that result five, that's also a real number. All of those numbers are elements of the real numbers. Similarly, we can go closed under multiplication, which is kind of similar to the same thing as closed under addition. If I were to take two real numbers and multiply them, my result is always another real number. So in this case, if I were to go two multiplied by three, which are both real numbers, my result is six, which is another real number. That's the key here. Again, it's fairly simple to look at right now and say, Clayton, this is easy, what are you doing? But trust me, later on, when we start dealing with vectors, it gets a little bit more complex. Now, the third one, kind of straying from the beaten path here is, it has to have a zero element. And in this case, in the set of real numbers, that's just simply zero, which basically means that we have a neutral element of addition. Now that sounds really crazy, but that's actually really simple. Basically means that there exists an element. When I add another element to it, it gives me the same result. Clayton, what does that mean? Let's say I take three and I add it to zero. Well, my result is three. So I end up with the same thing on both sides. So in this case, the zero there, that's what we call a neutral element of addition. Because I take three, I add it to that neutral element, and I still come out with three. The last one we have is every element has an inverse element of addition, which basically means if I were to take one of my elements, I can add something to it and my result will be zero. So if I were to take three and add it to negative three, I get zero. So this negative three here, we call that the inverse element. Easy way to think of this is if I had five, well, I also have negative five. If I have 10, I also have negative 10 and vice versa. If I have negative 10, I also have just 10. Again, looking at it here, piece of cake, not too bad, but it's going to uh, become a little bit more complex when we talk about vectors. Now, the thing to keep in mind with vectors though, is all four of these properties, they also apply to vectors. It's not really apparent how, but they do. And we're gonna talk about that in the next, uh, next lecture video. So another thing that we're gonna discuss is some mathematical symbols right after I take a little drink break. Again, my uh, voice is still coming back. Uh, throat's on fire right now, but uh, trying to get through it. <laughs> All right, let's do this. So the first one is for every. And it basically looks like an upside down A, as we can see there. And this means that, or, or basically we use this symbol to define a property that is related to every element in our set. So if we have a set of numbers and every single number has the exact same property, we can define that property using this for every sign. So for instance, if I have a set A, which is one, two, and three, I can actually define a lot of properties. So the first one is I can say for every element X, which is a part of A, X is greater than zero. We look at A, it's one, two, and three. All three of those are greater than zero, so this would be true. We can also say that for every element in A, X is an integer. It makes sense. If we look at A, one, two, and three, those are all integers, so we can actually make this statement as well. So if every, every element in a set has a specific property, we can use this for every sign. Now, the second one, it gets a little bit more complicated, is this exists, and we use a backwards E. We're basically just taking the alphabet and rotating it different ways. Now, this is used to define properties related to particular elements of a set. So it's basically the same as the first one, but in the for every, every element has to have that property. In this exists, only some of the elements have to have this property. So again, we know that A is one, two, and three. What I can say is there exists an element in A where it is greater than one. Now, if we look at A, there's two elements greater than one, but only two. Notice that one is not greater than one, it's equal to one. So if we were to look at this statement right here, some of the elements have that property. This is when I would use this exists sign. Now, the last one we have is exists and unique. This is basically the same as number two, but the only difference is that only one element 
has that property. So if I were to go A is one, two, and three, I would say that there exists a unique element in A where X is greater than two. Because if we look at one, two, and three, there is only one single element greater than two. So it basically goes for every element, some element, only one element. Now, I received a question in class and I think I misheard it. So I really want to emphasize this and I'm gonna send this out in, e in an email too. For this statement, statement three, could, have I, could I have just have went E with no explanation mark? Basically saying there exists an element in A where X is greater than two. And the answer is yes, you can. So if I wanted to in this last statement here, I could remove the explanation mark. It would still be true. However, it's just not good practice to do that. So I would, if there is only one element, I'd try my best to have the explanation mark. But if you were to just go E, you're, you're still fine. You're, yeah, it's still fine. The nice thing for this particular course is I don't really expect you guys to ever write out this kind of notation. This is more to help you guys with the textbook. The textbook has proofs for everything we are going to talk about. And for these proofs, they rely a lot on this nomenclature. So this is more for your benefit. It's not something I'm going to explicitly test you guys on, which is good news. Now, if we're covering crazy ass things found in the textbook, we have to move on to the crazy ones. This first one, the Kronecker Delta, is something you guys will probably see a lot, but never use in this particular class. If you guys <clears throat> move on to the grad course, either uh, solid mechanics or finite element analysis with me, well then there's no mercy. I will make sure that you guys use this all the time. But for this chronic or delta, it's basically a special symbol which returns a value of zero or one depending on the subscripts. So you're saying, Clayton, what does that mean? Well, this chronic or delta, delta ij, it's either equal to one when i is equal to j, so the two subscripts are the same, or it's equal to zero when the two subscripts are not the same. So for example, delta two two, as we can see, two and two are the exact same, so it's equal to one. But if I were to go delta one two, we know that this is equal to zero because one does not equal two. Again, this is something we use a lot in solid mechanics proofs for very general cases. It's not something we'll be using a lot in this class, but it's something to be aware of. Another one to kind of just be aware of, but we won't be using a lot in this class is the alternator, which is epsilon ijk. Now this is another special symbol, but instead of returning either zero or one, it can return one, negative one, or zero, depending again on the subscripts. So epsilon ijk is equal to one when ijk is a cyclic permutation of one, two, and three. Now it's also equal to, uh, not also, <laughs> it's equal to negative one if it's a non-cyclic permutation of one, two, and three. And in the other case, it's actually equal to zero. Now you guys may be saying, Clayton, what the hell is a cyclic permutation? And it's basically this, you got one, two, and three. If we were to go around in this circle, that's a cyclic permutation. If I were to still have one, two, and three, but go the opposite way, that's a non-cyclic permutation. Best way to show you guys is an example. So if we were to go epsilon two, three, one, that is actually a cyclic permutation. Because again, we have one, two, three, we're going two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, it forms that nice circle. So it's actually equal to one. Now, if I were to go epsilon three, two, one, well, this is a non-cyclic permutation. So it's equal to negative one. And it's easy to see. Again, if we have one, two, three, <coughs> well, instead of going one, two, three, one, two, three, we are now going three, two, one, three, two, one. So we're going the opposite direction. Now, the final case would be something like this, epsilon two, one, one. As we can see, this isn't a cycle at all. This is just nothing. So in this case, it would be equal to zero. So hopefully that makes sense. Again, something I promise I will never have on any assignment, midterm or exam, but something to be aware of when you guys are looking at solid mechanics uh, theory because it comes up everywhere. Now, the next thing we're gonna talk about is equivalence. And this is actually very simple. Basically what we do is we can write or we can use arrows to show an equivalent between two statements. Now, in this particular case, if I have an arrow that is pointing to the right, statement one to statement two, this is basically saying, if I know what statement one is, I can figure out what statement two is. It's obvious. 
From statement one, I can figure out statement two. So statement one implies statement two, but not the other way around. Statement two does not imply statement one. Now you guys may be saying, Clayton, I need an example. That's a little bit confusing. Take this right here. Clayton was born in Alberta. So Alberta is a province in Canada, kind of like a state. Now, if I'm born in a province or a state of Canada, well, we know that I was born in Canada. So from that first statement, I can say that Clayton was born in Canada. I know that. But if I were to go the other way around and just tell you I was born in Canada, well, you don't know what province I was born in or what state I was born in. So that's how we can see one statement applies one other thing, but it doesn't work going backwards. Now we can swap that around using the arrow to the left and simply swap it the other way. Now this was the typo that we had in class. Uh, Canada and Alberta in this statement was switched. I fixed it now, it's fixed in the notes, so you guys are good to go. So these are kind of obvious, but we also can say that statement one is equivalent to statement two. So in this case, if I know statement one, I know statement two. Or if I know statement two, I then know statement one. And you guys are saying, Clayton, well, how would this look in the context of continuum mechanics or mathematical preliminaries? Well, I can give you guys this right here. So if we look on the left, I'm saying that A is a subset of real numbers. From here, I know that A must contain real numbers. Now, on the other side, I said for every element in A, that element is a real number. So both of these statements are saying that A contains real numbers. So since we can say that on both sides, we can say that they are equivalent. Now, last thing we're going to talk about in this lecture is vectors and matrices. So the only thing I really want you guys to get out of here is we use R to denote real numbers. But if we have a superscript on them, that now defines a vector. So R to the power N is proportional to an N dimensional vector space. So for instance, if I say that X is an element of R2, what this basically means is that X is a vector with two components. So I don't really care how you guys write your brackets, but X is going to have X1 and X2. You guys can have it as a column, a row, or squiggle brackets. I don't really care, but this is all you guys need to know. If I were to say that X is an element of R3, well then this is a three component vector. And this can go on and on. So R4 would be a four component vector, etc. Now the nice thing for this course <clears throat> is that I will never test you guys above R3. And the reason why is because the nice thing about continuum mechanics and solid mechanics is it takes all that gross math that the nerds love so much and we give it actual meaning. We're actually using it to design actual things. Now, in the world I live in, and I'm pretty sure it's the same with you too, uh, we have 3D space. We don't have four-dimensional space. I'm, I'm sure it's out there, but we don't design for four-dimensional space. So everything we do can be applied to R4, R5, R6, etc., but it's not practical. So that's the nice thing about this course, is we're only going to deal with R3 because that's realistic. It's also why we don't see complex numbers in this course very often. We see them, but they usually indicate that something is not physically possible. And we're gonna discuss that a little bit later. We'll never actually use complex numbers because, well, if you're designing using complex numbers, I don't wanna be in the building you're in because you shouldn't have to use complex numbers to design things in reality. Now, last thing I'll say here is that xi is going to be the ith component of vector x, so pretty simple. So that's what we mean by r. So r2, two component vector, r3, three component vector. Now, moving on to matrices where we have m. It's going to be the same thing where that little n there, that denotes the size of the square matrices. So if I have m as an element of m3, this is going to be a three by three matrix where mij is the component in the ith row and the jth column of matrix M. Now, another thing too is, you guys may be wondering about what about a non-square matrix? What happens if I had a matrix that has two rows, but three columns? Well, this wouldn't actually happen in solid mechanics. Again, we are thinking about things that are actually realistic. If I were to express this desk as a matrix here, and I were to eliminate one of these columns, well, I'm basically taking away a dimension I'm basically saying, yeah, my desk cannot move vertically, but we know that it can. So when we're dealing with these physical phenomenons, 
it's most likely going to be a square matrices. There are some exceptions way later on, but that's way outside the scope of this course. So you guys don't have to worry about that too much. We're going to be dealing mainly with these square matrices and vectors, and that's it. And that's it for this actual lecture for you guys. So again, I apologize for uh, trying to record it in the actual lecture. The quality was garbage. You guys deserve better quality, quality than that. So hopefully this gives you guys a uh, much, much better quality. Uh, lectures are usually an hour and 20 minutes long. Uh, what I typically like to do is solve the examples in class. But for those of you who are in class, notice that I had an internet problem today. So the examples that I'm going was going to solve today, we're actually going to solve them tomorrow at the beginning of class. Or not tomorrow, but at the beginning of next lecture. So I won't do it here so that everyone has the exact same thing. This is where we left off in the in-person lecture, and this is where we're going to start next lecture. So I wanted to thank you guys all so much for listening. I really appreciate it. I hope that you guys have a fun semester with me in Continuum Mechanics. I'm very excited to uh, go through this course with you. So yeah, that's it for this lecture video. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. I will see you guys in the next lecture video.